and this is for Communications 532 and I am excited to talk to you about digital imaging today. Um, this is actually a subject that is near and dear to my heart as um, during my undergrad I actually minored in photography and so I do lifestyle and wedding photography um, on the side and so I'm really excited um, that this is the subject that I got to be able to share with you guys. Um, so the first thing we're going to go over is just um, why study digital imaging. Um, the first reason is it is the most popular and ubiquitous visual medium in the world and it only continues to grow. And I think that is something so unique about um, digital imaging is that it is an industry that is just continuing to grow and booming. Um, I mean now you see people taking photos everywhere and um, even using simple sites and programs for imaging and editing. Um, anyone can become a professional through that type of um, an opportunity. Um, it offers a way to place our world in context as well as a way to record our lives. And so I'm sure that, I mean, you've seen Grandma at the beach sharing pictures on Facebook. I know my, personally my grandmother has an iPhone and she takes pictures and shares them on Facebook. And so it's just an incredible opportunity um, for people to be able to share what's going on with them. Um, and I'm sure some of us can agree that sometimes people do overshare too. And then finally, uh, new imaging software and photography apps make it easier to be creative and make it easier to share our creations. So kind of like I talked just a couple minutes ago, I just said how, you know, there's so many different types of apps that people are learning how to edit on and um, just different type of easy ways and user-friendly opportunities for people to really become, I mean, really get into the industry. Um, and now I'm just going to go over a few popular photo sharing sites, as you can see in my corresponding PowerPoint. Um, the first being uh, Flickr. Flickr is an incredible way for people to be able to share photos and it actually said that 80% of what is shared on Flickr actually comes from cell phones. That blew my mind. I mean, absolutely blew my mind. Um, the next is probably the most popular and that's Instagram. Um, Instagram was the first solely photo sharing app um, that was created just probably around five years ago and um, this is an incredible way it's it's like Facebook but minus all the words and minus all the sharing it's just to share photos and videos um, short videos and so um, people are all all about that and it's probably uh, one of the most popular apps obviously there is Facebook um, that is probably the biggest way that people share photos and what's going on in their lives and then finally Twitter um, Twitter is also a way for people to be able to um, share share photos and give 122 characters about that photo. Um, next we're just going to talk about a little bit of the history. Um, the first photo was taken by Jovis Neep and it was in 1826 and the way that this process worked is it was actually an eight hour exposure of sunlight onto bitumen of Judea which is a type of asphalt. And so for eight hours he had this exposure and that is how the first photograph was created. Um, he called it heliography um, which is Greek for sun writing. So that is would be the first photograph. So you fast forward 150 years um, and you have film photography. And I actually have a special treat to show you guys. Um, this is a film camera, actually, and it belongs to me and it belonged to my father um, when he was probably around 15 years old. And so um, the way that film works is again with exposure but it takes a lot less of exposure and obviously there's a darkroom process and it was uh, a lot of a faster exposure um, and so it was just an incredible incredible I guess adaptation from what Joseph Neep had worked on um, in the past and the interesting thing about film is that um, it actually didn't change much for years and years I mean in the early 1900s film remained kind of the same all the way up into you know, probably when my mom was in college, when I was in, when I was younger, um, and I think that that is interesting because that was the status quo, just film photography. Um, and so next, we're just going to talk a little bit about early digital cameras. It wasn't until 1994 um, where Apple created the Quick Take 100. It could store eight photos on it, and it was 640 by 440 pixels. And so I think that was. Um, one of the first adaptations of that and then um, the creation of megapixels obviously and um, something interesting is that uh, Kodak was actually the leading um, company for film photography for years and years. Um, they started in 1880 and were the leader in film-based photography. 
um, they simply could not adapt to digital photography's arrival. So as soon as um, digital photography started taking over, um, Kodak could not keep up with that and they could not adapt and they filed for bankruptcy, which is actually a really a really sad day in 2012 for the film industry and for people who grew up around film and photography. And I actually have this old Kodak ready camera. I don't know if you've ever seen these, but um, the way that this worked was it actually had a uh, film inside and you would have the opportunity to take the picture and it would come out and be developed. So this is one of the early instant instant gratification photography pieces and um, I haven't gotten this one to to work. The last one I showed you I've actually gotten to work and actually developed the film in, in, the, in the dark room and everything. Um, but I think this guy's a lost cause. But i um, thankful to have it and to be able to share it with you guys. Um, next we're going to just talk about uh, recent development. Um, so micro four thirds cameras are something that um, are new and then interchangeable lens cameras is something that I really wanted to hit on. And that would be what this is. And so um, the way that this works is this is actually a film camera. So you can see the film would go right in, right in the back and this is battery operated and then it has the opportunity for interchangeable lenses. So now I just have its lens hood on. It has the opportunity to put different types of lenses. So this was an incredible opportunity because this gives you so much freedom and um, once you have your own lenses you in the own settings, it, give, it gave people the opportunity to truly know, oh, um, this is the relationship between aperture and, and ISO and, um, and shutter speed and it helped them to learn um, and so a lot of professional photographies started with these kind of guys. So when my parents got married, this would have been what their photographer used, was a, an SLR type of camera with an interchangeable lens. Um, and so I, I love this camera. Um, I've used it many times and developed the film in the darkroom myself. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And it, I mean, this is the thing that really challenges people to be able to learn how to do photography um, because there is no instant little video to be able to see, oh, did that picture turn out? Do I need to change the settings? You've got to know what settings you're doing and you've got to just kind of go for it. Um, and then, of course, the next is the DSLRs, um, which is digital single lens reflex. And that would be this one. And obviously, this is the camera that I use all more than any other camera. So when I'm shooting weddings, I use these. The lenses are a lot bigger than I use at weddings, but um, obviously this gives you the opportunity to see what you're doing and um, just has um, a whole lot more megapixels and uh, just you know helps with um, being able to learn even more so um, what, what, what the relationship between those three different things I talked about earlier. Um, yeah, and then let's see. And then the last would be the Litro, which is the light fill technology, which basically allows the user to take a picture without worrying about focus. And so this is a new technology that just allows people to kind of set something up and not have to worry about taking um, taking the picture and work, worrying about the focus. So I don't know if you've ever, um, you know, been taking a, a picture with your family and you're setting it on self-timer and you go back and you see that it's blurry um, and you're like, man, how do we get it to focus properly? Well, I think this is what the Litro tries to help um, fix that problem so people don't have to worry about too much where they're focusing and what they're focusing on. Um, and then we're going to just talk about some trends on software. And so first is called the Phase One. And this is a professional photographic workflow software. Um, and it's good professional editing. It, it's just something that people have been really capturing and, and, and really getting into. And um, it does not match the pure photo manipulation functions offered in Photoshop, but it is a really good alternative. And people um, have just been really uh, flooding to, to this new um, phase one um, editing software. Um, the next trend is actually mobile device Adobe Photoshop. And I have not personally um, done this yet. I do work in Photoshop and in, in the Adobe suite when I do my editing, but I haven't worked on the mobile devices yet. Um, but this is a trend that people have been having Photoshop right on their tablet, right on their cell phone. Um, and it syncs with devices. It's touch editing. Um, and so that's something that people have been, um, I guess, really getting into 
Um, I'd be curious to hear if any of you have done, done that specifically. Um, next would be the digital imaging file format. So Camera Raw, which is the native format of a digital image. And this is something that I actually use. I almost always shoot in Camera Raw, which is, um, like it said, it's the native format of digital image. Um, and what this does, it, it gives you the opportunity to then edit it in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, and what that um, gives you the opportunity to do is you basically get to edit more details of, of the image because you you left it in its native in its native formatting. And so things like white balance that you wouldn't necessarily be able to change once you've taken the picture, you can change if you leave if you leave it in a, in camera camera raw and um, then edit in camera raw. And you know these files are exponentially bigger, which is why you know if you're on family vacation you may might not need to take all the pictures in camera raw. Um, but for wedding photographers, professional photographers, um, or people who are just really wanting to work on their editing to keep it in the native formatting of Camera Raw is a, a really wise thing to do um, because then when you're going back through and editing, you have more control over what you're editing and how you're editing. Um, and I think it's incredible. But as I said, you know, I have so many external hard drives because um, it, is, it is such a big, bigger file than just a, a regular JPEG or TIFF. Um, and then some of the current trends is, um, so DSLRs are forecasted to reach 85% of houses which was within the next 10 years. Um, and I think that's crazy. And I, you know, and I do have people often asking me, oh, I, you know, I want to get, you know, my son or daughter um, a nicer camera. What would you recommend? Um, and so I have noticed people going more for DSLRs and wanting um, and, and having the desire to learn more about photography. Um, and so I think that's fantastic. Um, and then, as you all know, smartphones are increasing. And we're actually going to get more into that. Um, the most interesting thing about smartphones is that Generation Y, I'm a part of this generation, but um, there are 83% of cell phone users within Generation Y have smartphones. Uh, but only 50%, 58% of the rest of the um, generations have smartphones. And I thought that was very interesting. And um, I think that percentage has probably even increased um, since we've, um, since the book has come out, since our book has come out. Um, but I just thought that was extremely interesting. And then um, obviously smartphones are used, as we talked in the beginning of this presentation, are used to uh, for social networking. So high network from camera phones. Um, and I just found that to be extremely interesting and in how um, you know, sometimes people are going on family vacation, they don't even bring a phone or a, um, a camera, they're bringing their phone and they're only simply using their phone and relying on their phone um, for the images, to, to capture images for, um, for, their, entire, for their entire vacation. Um, and so that brings me to the end of my presentation and the question that I have for you guys is, how do you feel the emerging use of phones as sole cameras will adapt and change the digital Im Im image industry in the future. I'll read that again. So how do you feel the emerging use of phones as sole cameras will adapt slash change the digital imaging industry in the future? Well, thank you guys for listening um, through this presentation. It was a joy for me to be able to talk about these things. I get really excited um, when I get to talk about photography. So uh, if you have any questions, just please let me know, and I'm looking forward to watching all the rest of your presentations as well. Thank you.